Hyde and Dr. Zake, senior ENT consultant. The topic is peritonsillar abscess. So, first we will see, I will tell you about the tonsils. Tonsils are small paired almond shaped structure seen in the oropharynx. These are the tonsils. Each tonsil, it has got a covering which is called as a capsule and outside that you have a muscle. If there is infection of the tonsil, it is termed as tonsillitis. What happens in peritonsillar abscess is that first the infection it starts from here and it spreads and crosses the covering and it will be in between the covering of the capsule and the muscle. Let me show you the structure. So this is the capsule and this is a muscle. So there will be abscess formation between the capsule of the palatine tonsil and the muscle which is seen laterally and usually it is seen in the upper part of the tonsil. This is usually seen between the age group of 20 and 40 and the, to start with it will be tonsillitis and it can uh, it can lead on to cellulitis that is fluid formation inside and if, if at this stage it is not properly treated and, and or the antibiotic is not effective enough what happens is it goes to the next stage and forms and form the abscess. The predisposing factors are like how I, what I have told you earlier it is common between uh, common in males between the age group of 20 and 40 that means in puberty and it is more so common in smokers and if the dental hygiene is very bad. The complication rate of this disease becomes high if there is if the patient is in an immunodeficiency stage. The etiologies are it can be tonsillitis to start with or it can be secondary to a foreign body say like any foreign body which gets stuck in the, in the soft palate on the tonsil or the infection can spread from poor dental hygiene or because of a dental caries or abscess. The last it has been uh, it is said that there are small glands which are seen outside the tonsil between the capsule and the uh, muscle. These glands are termed as Weber's glands. The infection of Weber's glands and which can progress to abscess formation too. So these are the etiology. The common presentation, let me tell you about the common presentation. It will start with fever, body pain, malaise and patient will complain that they have a throat pain and they are not able to swallow anything even their own saliva and most of them when they are in the stage of abscess formation they say that the pain inside is so severe that they are not able to swallow their own saliva and there will be a pin pricking sensation always and each time when they try to swallow they have the ear pain of that particular side too. Now, they have their speech also will be muffled speech on examination they will be febrile and they will not be able to open the mouth properly means they have Christmas so when we examine the oropharynx inside if they are in a stage of cellulitis what you find is the tonsils may be enlarged and pushed medially and the same side in the upper part this part which is called the soft palate it will be it will be congested uh, with mild bulge mainly it will be congested. Suppose it has gone from this stage which is a peritonsal cellulitis, it has gone to peritonsal abscess, the picture is going to be different, it is going to be like this. That is the tonsils will be pushed medially and uvula will be deviated, the small one here will be deviated and there will be a significant bulge of the soft palate, significant bulge and be red and it will be congested, red in color, it will be bulging. This is a typical feature, that is how it looks like. Now, the same side neck examination, we will find a small swelling which is called the cervical node and it will be tender to touch. Now coming to the investigation. For we have a specific investigation and related investigations. Specific investigation means how you come to a diagnosis of this condition. When you put in a white bore needle, say like 18 gauge needle into that side, that is over the tonsil, over the soft palate. We will be able to aspirate pus. 
and this pus can be sent, sent for uh, examination gram stain and culture and sensitivity. Second investigation is that we can confirm even with CT scan with contrast. But usually this is done old, not in a straightforward case of peritonsillar abscess, but in a case of peritonsillar abscess with associated complications of other, uh, what are the other complications I will tell you later. Now, uh, this is a CT scan of a patient diagnosed uh, of uh, peritonsillar abscess, we can see abscess here. The other investigations being, when we put a camera inside the nose and have a look at the nasopharynx, that is what I mean to say is when you do a flexible nasopharyngoscopy, we can see a bulge, we can come to a diagnosis also. Or we can supplement with an x-ray that also may show there is a deviation there. If we, we can take a throat swab also, but usually when there is an aspirate, there is pus, I would like to send the pus for culture sensitivity rather than taking a throat swab. When you do a total count and differential count, that, that is when you do a blood test, you will find that the total count, blood cell, white blood cell count is high and especially so if it is bacterial, uh, the neutrophil count is going to be high. Along with that, when you do a C-reactive protein or, or, uh, or pro-calcitonin, the values are going to be elevated. We have to do quantitative analysis. Sometimes what happens is, there is a specific disease called infectious mononucleosis which is caused by a specific virus. And even that condition can lead to peritonsillar abscess. In that case, to rule out that condition, we have to do either monospore test or viral catheter antigen. Any one of these will do. Now, coming to the treatment. So, I prefer to admit the patient. Start with bed rest and uh, balanced diet. I'll advise him to drink lots of water and throat gargle will come, come to it. The first thing is I'll put in a uh, IV cannula and I'll start an IV fluid because the past three, four days, he was not been able to eat or drink properly and even his own saliva he was not able to swallow. So he will be feeling weak and tired. So first I'll try to hydrate him. So when you do hydrate, what happens is his pain management, the pain threshold gets altered and he'll be able to bear the pain better and whatever medication we give is going to be effective. Second, at the same time, I will start with IV antibiotic and painkillers too. And I will give a single shot of steroid, single shot only. How this is going to help me? Steroid along with the painkiller, it will decrease the pain fast, faster and the redness of the congestion inside the throat is going to be decreased faster and the patient will be in a good, uh, uh, nice mood, elevated mood too. Balance that, I have already uh, uh, told you that it has to be balanced that not very uh, spicy and not very hot and he, they have to drink lots of water also. The throat gargle, it can be done with salt water or salt water with lemon or with betadine or with hexidine, whatever commercially available preparation you have. See when you do with betadine, how you have to prepare is that along with 30, in 30 ml of clean water, you have to add a 5 to 10 ml of 10 percentage betadine and you have to gargle the throat and that you allow the betadine solution to be in the throat for 30 seconds and spit it out. And after that, for next 30 minutes, please do not drink or eat anything and allow the medicine to be in the throat so that it can, can do its action well. Now, the treat specific treatment. So what the problem in this condition is there is abscess inside. The abscess anywhere, it has to be removed, it has to be drained. Whatever antibiotic you give is not going to be effective. But in a case of cellulitis, maybe it will work. The antibiotics can work. Even the other, other treatment can work. But not when you have an abscess. So when you have an abscess, what you have to do is you have to remove the, remove the uh, pus. So we have two techniques for that. One is either you can do a uh, needle aspiration, which we do with the help of an agent gauge needle. And we see which is the maximum pointing area. And uh, we will aspirate the whole how much of a pus is possible. So before doing this, I uh, I would have already started with IV fluids, given a shot of uh, steroid, started antibiotics and uh, some fluids so that he becomes fresh. And this procedure is not done in the operation data, it is done in the OPD itself. So I will try to remove as much of abscess as possible and whatever I have removed, I will send it for culture, gram stain and culture and sensitivity. And this is a site of aspiration, that's what I have marked. Now the next alternative is, I like to drain the abscess. So if you ask me whether I like to do aspiration or drain, I will say both. Because 
I'll do aspiration mainly for diagnosis. Two, I'll take the pus for culture and sensitivity. Once that is done, at the site of uh, needle uh, prick, the same site, I'll put in an instrument like this and I'll drain the whole abscess. This, will, this technique will allow me to drain the whole abscess. What happens is when you drain the abscess completely, the same day and night, the patient gets a lot of difference. He says the next day that he was able to sleep well and the pin pricking sensation is completely gone. So that uh, tells me that I have removed all the abscess completely. If the patient still says, no, I had pain, I was able to sleep, but I still have some pain pricking sensation, that means there is some abscess left behind, I have to reopen or redrain once again. So some of the patients, we need to drain one or two times. So the main treatment being aspiration or drainage. Now, coming to the complications. So if the swelling is, uh, uh, is more, it may result in airway obstruction. And sometimes what happens is the abscess breaks off its own and it may result in aspiration and chest infection too. Sometimes what happens is the abscess, it can spread from the, tons the peritonsal area. It can spread into the uh, surrounding tissue, say like the uh, neck space spaces and it can lead to systemic infection in the body too, which is called as septicemia. So these complications are more common in, in smokers, alcoholics, or if the immunodeficiency state or the patient is very weak, usually they don't go into such complications. Now, the, this condition, peritonsillar abscess, usually when, when, whatever I have told you, uh, when all these are done, the treatment, it takes only three to four days. By most of the patient, by fourth or fifth day, he will be able to go home. At the time of discharge, your advice is going to be that you have to take bed rest, drink lots of water, be on balanced diet, and try to avoid junk foods, and avoid any oily preparations, spicy preparations, hot food, and continue the throat gargle, and antibiotic, you have to take a full course. That is not five days, it is going to be seven to 10 days. And along with that, you need painkiller also. Now, the, the first point of uh, the improvement, the first point of improvement is, the patient says that he is able to open the mouth properly. That means he has started improving. So at the same time, when we examine, the same side tones of the upper part of the tones of the soft palate, it's going to be less red in color, less congested. And we will do a blood test at the same time. It shows that when you compare with the previous admission uh, time blood test, it shows that all the parameters, inflammatory markers, it has started coming down. That's the time we, we start discussing about, um, decide about whether, when to discharge. So these are the first signs of, this is uh, signs of improvement. So you, there's going to be a uh, regular review, which is done after uh, seven to 10 days. In, in this period, you have to follow all this order and don't forget to take the full course of antibiotic. That's a must. This is how we manage peritonsillar abscess. Thank you so much.